Psalm 37, verse 4, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. This psalm in the beginning is a heap of instructions. The great lesson intended in it is placed in verse 1, Fret not yourself because of evildoers, neither be envious against the workers of iniquity. It is resumed in verses 7 and 8, where many reasons are alleged to enforce it. Fret not. 1. Do not envy them. Be not troubled at their prosperity. 2. Do not imitate them. Be not provoked by their glowworm happiness to practice the same wickedness to arrive to the same prosperity. 3. Be not sinfully impatient and quarrel not with God. Because he has not by his providence allowed you the same measures of prosperity in the world, don't accuse him of injustice and cruelty because he afflicts the good and is indulgent to the wicked. Leave him to dispense his blessings according to his own mind. And four, don't condemn the way of piety and religion in which you are. Think not the worse of your profession because it is attended with affliction. The reason of this exhortation is rendered in verse 2, For they shall soon be cut down as a grass, and wither as a green herb, amplified by a similitude or resemblance of their prosperity to grass. Their happiness has no stability. It has, like grass, more of color and show than strength and substance. Grass nods this and that way with every wind. The mouth of a beast may pull it up, or the foot of a beast may tread it down. The scorching sun in summer or the fainting sun in winter will deface its complexion. The psalmist then proceeds to positive duties, verse 3, faith. Trust in the Lord. This is a grace most fit to quell such impatiencies. The stronger the faith, the weaker the passion. Impatient motions are signs of a flagging faith. Many times men are ready to cast off their help in Jehovah and address to the God of Ekron. Multitudes of friends are riches, but you trust in the Lord, in the promises of God, in the providence of God. Number two, obedience. Do good. Trust in God's promises and observe his precepts. These must be linked together. It is but a pretended trust in God where there is real walking in the paths of wickedness. Let not the glister of the world render you faint and languid in a course of piety. Number three, the keeping of your station. Do good, because wicked men flourish. Don't hide yourself therefore in a corner, but keep your sphere. Run your race, and verily you shall be fed. You shall have everything needful for you. And now because men delight in that in which they trust, the psalmist averts us from all other objects of delight to God as a true object. Delight yourself in the Lord. Place all your pleasure and joy in Him. And because the motive expresses the answer of prayer, the duty enjoined seems to respect the act of prayer as well as the object of prayer. Prayer coming from a delight in God and a delight in seeking Him. Trust is both the spring of joy and the spring of supplication. When we trust him for sustenance and preservation, we shall receive them. So when we delight in seeking him, we shall be answered by him. In the act of delighting in the object in the Lord, to the motive he shall give you the desires of your heart, the most substantial desires, those desires which he approves of. The desire of your heart is gracious, though not the desire of your heart is carnal. The desire of your heart is a Christian, though not the desire of your heart is a creature. He shall give. God is the object of our joy and the author of our comfort. Doctrine. Delighting God in seeking Him only procures gracious answers, or without cheerful prayers we cannot have gracious answers. There are two parts. One, cheerfulness on our part grants that on God's part, cheerfulness and delight on our parts, joy is the tuning of the soul. The command to rejoice precedes the command to pray for Thessalonians 5, verses 16 and 17. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. Delight makes a melody. Prayer else will be but a harsh 
sound. God accepts the heart only when it is a gift given, not forced. Delight is a marrow of religion. Dullness is not suitable to the great things we are chiefly to beg for. Gospel discoveries are a feast, Isaiah 25, verse 6. Dullness becomes not such a solemnity. Manna must not be sought for with a dumpish heart. With joy we are to draw water out of the wells of salvation, Isaiah 12, verse 3. Faith is a bucket, but joy and love are the hands that move it. They are the her and Aaron that hold up the hands of Moses. God does not value that man's service who accounts not his service a privilege and a pleasure. Dullness is not suitable to the duty. Gospel duties are to be performed with a gospel temper. God's people ought to be a willing people, Psalm 110, verse 3. A people of willingness, as though in prayer no other faculty of the soul had its exercise but the will. This must breathe fully in every word as the Spirit in Ezekiel's wills. Delight, like the angel, Judges 1320, must ascend in the smoke and flame of the soul. Though there be a kind of union by contemplation, yet the real union is by affection. A man cannot be said to be a spiritual king if he does not present his performances with a royal and prince-like spirit. It is for vigorous wrestling that Jacob is called a prince, Genesis 32, verse 8. This temper is essential to grace. Natural men are described to be of a heavy and weary temper in the offering of sacrifices, Malachi 1, verse 13. It was but a sickly lame lamb they brought for an offering, and yet weary of it that which was not fit for their table, they thought fit for the altar. In the handling of this doctrine I will show what this delight is, from where it springs, the reasons of the doctrine, and the application. What this delight is. Delight properly is an affection of the mind. It springs from the possession of good which has been ardently desired. This is a top stone, the highest step. Delight is but an embryo until it come to fruition, and that's certain and immutable. Otherwise, if there be probability or possibility of losing that which we have present possession of, the fear of it as a drop of gall that infects the sweetness of this passion. Delight properly is a silencing of desire in the banquet of the soul on the presence of its desired object. But there is a delight of a lower stamp, one in desires, there is a delight in desire as well as in fruition, a cheerfulness in labor as well as in attainment. The desire of Canaan made the good Israelites cheerful in the wilderness. There is an inchoate delight in motion, but a consummate delight in rest and fruition. Secondly, in hopes. Desired happiness affects the soul much more. Expected happiness, Romans 5, verse 2. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God natural issue of a well-grounded hope. A tottering expectation will engender, but a tottering delight. Such a delight will madmen have, which is rather to be pitied than desired. But if an imaginary hope can affect a heart with some real joy, much more a hope settled upon a sure bottom and raised upon a good foundation. There may be joy in a title as well as in possession. Number three, in contemplation. The consideration and serious thoughts of heaven affect a gracious heart and fill it with pleasure, though itself be as if in a wilderness. The near approach to a desired good much affects the heart. Moses was surely more pleased with the sight of Canaan from Mount Pisgah than with the hopes of it in the desert. A traveler's delight is more raised when he is nearest his journey's end and a hungry stomach has a greater joy when he sees the meat approaching which must satisfy the appetite. As the union with the object is nearer, so the delight is stronger. Now this delight the soul has in duty is not a delight of fruition, but of desire, hope, or contemplation. We may consider delight as active or passive. First, active, which is an act of our souls and our approaches to God when the heart, 
like the sun, rouses up itself as a giant to run a spiritual race. Or passive, which is God's dispensation and approaches to us, and often met with in our cheerful addresses to God, Isaiah 64, 5. Rejoices and works righteousness. When we delightfully clasp about the throne of grace, God often casts his arms about our necks, especially when cheerful prayers accompanied with cheerful obedience. This joy is when Christ meets us in prayer with a be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven, your request is granted. The active delight is the health of the soul. The passive is a good complexion of the soul. Duty, the other God's peculiar gift. The one is the inseparable property of the new birth, the other a separable privilege. There may be joy in God when there is little joy from God. There may be gold in the mine when no flowers are on the surface. Number two, we may consider delight as settled or transient, as spiritual or sensitive. A settled delight in strong and grown Christians when prayer proceeds out of a thankfulness to God, a judicious knowledge and apprehension of God. The nearer to God, the more delight, as the motion of a stone is most speedy when nearest its center. Number two, a sensitive delight. As in persons troubled in mind, there may be a kind of delight in prayer, because there is some sense of ease in the very vent in itself, and in some because of the novelty of a duty they were not accustomed to before, may be put up by persons in necessity without any spiritual delight in them. As crazy persons take more medicine than those that are healthy and observe the spring and fall, yet they delight not in the medicine. The Pharisee could pray longer and perhaps with some delight too, but upon a sensual ground, with a proud and vaunting kind of cheerfulness, a delight in himself, and the publican had a more spiritual delight, though a humble sorrow in the consideration of his own vileness, yet a delight in the consideration of God's mercy. The sensitive delight may be more sensible in a young than in a grown Christian. There is a more sensible affection at the first meeting of friends, though more solid after some conversation, as there is a love which is called the love of the espousals. As it is in sorrow for sin, so in this delight a young convert has a greater torrent, a grown Christian a more constant strain. As at the first conversion of a sinner, there is an overflowing joy among the angels, which we read not of after, though without question there is a settled joy in them at the growth of a Christian. An elder son may have a delight in his father's presence, more rooted, firm, and rational, than a younger child that clings more about him with affectionate expressions. As sincerity is the soul of all graces and duties, so this delight is the luster and embroidery of them. Now, this delight in prayer, in hearty delight, as of the subject of it, it is seated in the heart. A man in prayer may have a cheerful countenance and a drowsy spirit. The Spirit of God dwells in the heart, and love and joy are the first fruits of it, Galatians 5.22. Love to duty, and joy in it. Joy is a grace, not as a mere comfort. As God is hearty in offering mercy, so is the soul in petitioning for it, between God and the heart. Where there is delight, there is great pains taken with the heart. A gracious heart strikes itself again and again, as Moses did the rock, twice. Those ends which God is in giving are a Christian's ends in asking. Now the more of our hearts in the request, the more of God's hearts in the granting of the request. The emphasis of mercy is God's whole heart and whole soul in it. Jeremiah 32, verse 41. So the emphasis of duty is our whole heart and whole soul. As without God's cheerful answering, a gracious soul would not relish a mercy. So without our hearty asking, God does not relish our prayer. Number two, it is a delight in God who is the object of prayer. The glory of God, communion with Him, enjoyment of Him, is the great end of a believer in his supplications. That delight which is in prayer is chiefly in it as a means conducing to such an end, and is but a spark of that delight which his soul has in the object of prayer. God is the center in which his soul rests, 
in the end which the soul aims at, according to our apprehensions of God or our desires for him. When we apprehend him as the chiefest good, we shall desire him and delight in him as the chiefest good. There must first be a delight in God before there can be a spiritual delight or a permanency in duty. Job 27 verse 10. Will he delight himself in the Almighty? Will he always call upon God? Delight is of grace, and as faith, desire, and love have God for their object, so has this. And according to the strength of our delight in the object or end is the strength of our delight in the means of attainment. When we delight in God as glorious, we shall delight to honor him. When we regard him as good, we shall delight to pursue and enjoy him, and delight in that which brings us to an intercourse with him. To him. The joy of the Lord is our strength, Nehemiah 8, verse 10. The more joy in God, the more strength to come to him. The lack of this is a reason of our snail-like motion to him. Men have no sweet thoughts of God and therefore no mind to converse with him. We cannot judge our delight in prayer to be right if we have not a delight in God, for natural men may have a delight in prayer when they have corrupt and selfish ends. They may have a delight in a duty as it is a means, according to their apprehensions, to gain such an end. As Balaam and Balak offered their sacrifices cheerfully, hoping to indulge with God and have liberty to curse his people. A delight in the precepts and promises of God, which are the ground and rules of prayer. First, David delights in God's testimonies and then calls upon him with his whole heart. A gracious heart must first delight in precepts and promises before it can turn them into prayers. For prayer is nothing else but a presenting God with his own promise, desiring to work that in us and for us which he has promised to us. None was more cheerful in prayer than David, because none was more rejoicing in the statutes of God. God's statutes were his song, Psalm 119, verse 54. And the divine word was sweeter to him than the honey and honeycomb. If our hearts leap not at a divine promise, we are like to have but drowsy souls and desiring them. If our eye be not upon the dainties God sets before us, our desires cannot be strong for him. If we have no delight in the great charters of heaven, the rich legacies of God, how can we sue for them? In the covenant of grace, we shall not delight in prayers for grace. It was the hopes of reward made Moses so valiant in suffering, and the joy set before Christ and a promise made him so cheerful in enduring the shame. Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2. Secondly, from what does this delight springs? From the Spirit of God. Not a spark of fire upon our own hearth that is able to kindle the spiritual delight. It is the Holy Ghost that breathes such an heavenly heat into our affections. The Spirit is the fire that kindles the soul. The spring that moves the wash. The wind that drives the ship. The swiftest ship with spread sails will be but sluggish in its motion unless the wind fills its sails. Without the Spirit we are but in a weak and sickly condition our breath but short, a heavy and troublesome asthma is upon us, Psalm 138, verse 3. When I cried unto you, you did strengthen me with strength in my soul. His prayer is the work of the Spirit in the heart, so does the light in prayer owe itself to the same author. God will make them joyful in his house of prayer, Isaiah 56, 7. Number two, from grace. The Spirit kindles, but gives us the oil of grace to make the lamp burn clear. There must not only be wind to dry, but cells to catch it. A prayer without grace is a prayer without wings. There must be grace to begin it. A dead man cannot rejoice in his land, money, or food, but cannot act and therefore cannot be cheerful in action. Cheerfulness supposes life. Dead men cannot perform a duty. Psalm 115 verse 17, the dead don't praise the Lord, nor dead souls the cheerful duty. There must not only be grace infused, but grace actuated. No man in a sleep or swoon can rejoice. There must not only be a living principle, but a living operation. If the sap lurk only in the root, the branches can bring forth no fruit. Our best prayers without the sap of grace diffuse in itself will be but as withered branches. Grace actuated puts heed into performances without which they are but benumbed and frozen. Rusty grace, as a rusty key will not unlock, 
will not enlarge the heart, there must be grace to maintain it. There is not only need of fire to kindle the lamp, but of oil to preserve the flame. Number three, from a good conscience. A good heart is the continual feast. Proverbs 15, verse 15. He that has a good conscience must needs be cheerful in his religious and civil duties. Guilt will come trembling and with a sad countenance into the presence of God's majesty. A guilty child cannot with cheerfulness come into a displeased father's presence. A soul smoked with hell cannot with delight approach to heaven. Guilty souls in regard of the injury they have done to God will be afraid to come. In regard of the foot of sin in which they are defiled, and the blackness they have contracted they will be ashamed to come. Number four, from a holy and frequent familiarity with God. Where there is great familiarity, there is great delight. Delight in one another's company and delight in one another's converse. Tea and go unto a God with whom we are acquainted than to a God to whom we are strangers. This encourages the soul to go to God. I go to a God whose face I have seen, whose goodness I have tasted, with whom I have often met in prayer. Frequent familiarity makes us more apprehensive of the excellency of another. An excellency apprehended will be beloved, and being beloved will be delighted in. From a sense of former mercies and acceptation, if manna be rained down, it does not only take off our thoughts from Egyptian garlic, but quickens our desires for a second shower. A sense of God's majesty will make us lose our garishness, and a sense of God's love will make us lose our dumpishness. We may as well come again with a merry heart when God accepts our prayers as go away and eat our bread with joy when God accepts our works. Reasons for this. Without cheerful seeking, we cannot have a gracious answer. God will not give an answer to those prayers that dishonor him. A flat and dumpish temper is not for his honor. The heathen themselves thought their God should not be put off with a sacrifice dragged to the altar. We read of no lead, that lumpish earthly metal employed about the tabernacle or temple, but the purest and most glistering sorts of metals. Number two, dull or lumpish prayer does not reach him, and therefore cannot expect an answer. Such desires are as arrows that sink down at our feet. There is no force to carry them to heaven. The heart is an unbent bow that has no strength. When God will hear, he makes first a prepared heart, Psalm 10, verse 17. He first rings the instrument and then receives the sound. An enlarged heart only runs, Psalm 119, verse 32. A contracted heart moves slowly and often faints in the journey. Number three, lumpishness speaks an unwillingness that God should hear us. It speaks a kind of fear that God should grant our petitions. He that puts up a petition to a prince coley and dully gives him good reason to think that he does not care for an answer. The husbandman has no great mind to a harvest that is lazy in tilling his ground and sowing his seed. How can we think God should delight to read over our petitions when we take so little delight in presenting them? God doesn't give mercy to the unwilling person. The first thing God does is to make his people willing. Dull spirits seek God as if they did not care for finding him. Such tempers either account not God real or their petitions unnecessary. Number four, without delight, we are not fit to receive a mercy. Delight in a mercy wanted makes room for desire, and large desires make room for mercy. If no delight in begging, there will be no delight in enjoying. If there be no cheerfulness to quicken our prayers when we need a blessing, there will be little joy to quicken our praise when we receive a blessing. And finally, application. There is a great pleasure in the ways of God if rightly understood. Prayer, which is a duty in which we express our wants, is delightful. There is more sweetness in a Christian's asking than in a wicked man's enjoying blessing. Will there be in heaven? If there be such sweetness in desire, what will there be in full fruition? There is joy in seeking what is there than in finding. Duty has its sweets, its thousands, but glory is ten thousands. If the pleasure of the seed time be so great, what will the pleasure of the harvest be? Number three, the miserable condition of those that can delight in anything but prayer. It is an aggravation of our enmity to God when we can sin cheerfully and pray dully, when duty is more loathsome than iniquity. View of examination. We pray, but how are our hearts? 
If it be for what concerns our momentary being, is not our running like the running of a hymn as? But when for spiritual things do not our hearts sink within us like navels? Let us therefore follow our hearts close. Don't allow them to give us a slip in our examination of them. Don't resolve to take the first answer, but search to the bottom. Ask yourself whether you delight at all in prayer. How do you prize the opportunities of this duty? There is an opportunity of an earthly and an opportunity of a heavenly gain. Consider which our hearts more readily close with. Can we with much pleasure follow a vain world and heartlessly welcome an opportunity of duty? Delight more with Judas and bags and in Christ's company? This is sad. But our praying opportunities, they should be festival times. Do we go to the house of God with a voice and joy of praise? How are our hearts affected in prayer? Are we more ready to pray ourselves asleep than into a vigorous frame? Do we enter into it with some life and find our hearts quickly tire and jade us? Are we more awake when we are up than when we are all the time upon our knees? Are our hearts in prayer like withered, sapless things and very quick afterwards if in worldly business? Are we like logs and blocks in prayer and like a row upon the mountains in earthly concerns? Surely what our pulse beats quickest to is the object most delighted in. 